Welcome on into the Between the Hash Marks podcast. As always, Matt Lombardo, Mike Tanier, and today I will be eating this Belgian waffle for a pretty major occasion and a pretty monumental event for the Between the Hash Marks podcast. Mike, what's going on? What what brands of waffle are you purchasing? This is a homemade from the waffle iron waffle made just before we got on the show here, because yeah. as I let you know on Saturday, I filled you in about this on Saturday, yeah. a great email that came across from the podcast folks. Mm -hmm. The Between the Hash Marks podcast is pretty big in Belgium and pretty big in the Netherlands. Yes. As far as football podcasts go. <laughs> yeah. the Between as, as far as NFL football podcasts go, to make that yes. clear. Yes, yeah, very quick. Yeah, the, the Between the Hash Marks podcast is the number two ranked podcast in Belgium. Now, I don't know if there are only two NFL podcasts in Belgium or what's <laughs> happening here, but Lombardo and Tanya are big in Belgium. We're ranked number nine in the NFL category in the Netherlands, number 37 in the category football in Germany, number 64 in Japan, and here in the United States where there's a little bit more competition 114th. 114th ain't bad. Not but bad. Guessing, but I'm guessing in Belgium it's it's Mina and then us. And and there's a couple of there's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, we we know very little about Belgium besides Jean Claude Van Damme and waffles. But secondly, when we said let's eat waffles on the podcast, and then uh we said right before we went on, hey, let's take a couple of minutes to cook a waffle. Yes. I assumed Lombardo meant grab an ego. <laughs> Grab an ego out the freezer, stick it in the in in the the, uh, the air fryer, and then put yes. some butter on it. You went and like made a waffle in in honor of our friends and neighbors and and listeners in Belgium. I, I made a Belgium waffle. Now I, I do think that we stumbled on something very interesting here because my eating habits have been okay. uh, maligned and and joked about over the years. I do. We stumbled on something. We both like our ego waffles just slathered in butter. I don't need the maple syrup on the ego. Just give right. me the butter. Right. Well, just like you like your hamburgers with nothing on them and take the just cheese. Off of them. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm glad you did that, though. I, I, I imagine that's why we took so long to get on. You were whisking the batter and things like that. Cracking the um, egg. But you, you had to crack the egg. Uh, yes. And perhaps a little bit of cinnamon and powdered sugar in there. I don't know. But I'm glad because the ego is a little bit of an, an insult to our Belgian uh, our listeners and viewers because this is their culture we're talking about. So worried that I might be a little insulting. I got something a little more traditionally Ooh. Belgian here. This is Ch Look at you. Cinq cent, six, uh, five, whatever's five, five centuries, I believe that is. Um, my, my French is amazing. Um, and I would I would be cracking this right now because I'm an empty nester, Matt. I can drink at uh, at noon on a Tuesday if I choose to without messing up a childcare situation. However, I would then probably be sick to my stomach for the rest of the afternoon because I'm old, especially if I used that to wash down this. Yes, for sure. So okay. thank you, a, a sincere thank you don't, to don't, our friends and listeners in Belgium. Don't, don't podcast with your mouth full. I'm just going to vamp while you chew and swallow, and then you can introduce the next concept while I eat this. That's why I take a big swing of the water. We have just lost all of our viewers across the world. Japan is right out. Japan just found that absolutely disgusting, uh, that much like fried dough being stuffed in your mouth. But you're back now. You're ready to eat. Yes, and I can't wait for when we climb the rankings in Germany because then we can bust out the imported German beers mm -hmm. like the one that I had in Epcot drinking around the world that I have become a fan of and need to track down here uh, in the beautiful Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to replicate the experience in Epcot because it was a delicious stout. I'll tell you right now, Belgian beer, greater than, greater than, greater than, greater than simple German beer. Calling it, sorry, sorry, German uh, viewers, don't get mad. I will yeah. say this though, one thing that is not greater, that is not greater than right now, is the Philadelphia Eagles secondary in 2024 compared to the secondary that finished up the 2023 campaign in Philadelphia. Mike, you, we could talk about every different angle of that Monday night game in Philadelphia, but the big takeaway for me watching that game is the final minute and 35 seconds where Kirk Cousins completed six passes 
to drive 70 yards down the field without needing to take a timeout and yeah. ultimately hitting Drake London for a touchdown. And the Eagles go from leading 21 uh, to 15 yeah. to walking out that building 22, 21 losers. Getting down the field, getting out of bounds twice. And you're talking about the secondary. Where's the pass rush? The what? Where's the pass rush? The what? The pass rush. That's where four guys, including Jalen Carter and Bryce Huff, who was supposed to be this pass rushing machine, and, you know, Brandon Graham, who was safe harmless. He had a very good game overall. And others are supposed to be tackling the immobile Kirk Cousins and not giving him several seconds to wait until Darnell Mooney, a veteran wide receiver, gets open on a rookie, Quinion Mitchell. Where were they? Where were they at the end? It was not existent. It was almost as if Vic Fangio decided that they were going to, you know, drop back and trust yeah. the young corners against the big bodied, speedy Falcons receivers. And it just didn't quite work out. And I think that any Eagles fan watching that game, as excited as you might be about what they did in the first half and Saquon averaging eight yards per carry, as yeah. excited as you might want to be about the tush push working to perfection, even with Jason Kelsey cracking jokes alongside Joe Buck and Troy Aikman in the broadcast booth. The the biggest takeaway and the most damning concern for the Eagles is that secondary is no better. It's no better with Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay than it was with Darius Slay and James Bradbury a year ago, and it came back to bite them last night. Disagree. Really? Disagree. Again, I'm looking at that, and it, it wasn't like they were rushing three. They were rushing four and getting nothing. They were rushing four guys – our high draft picks and free agent acquisitions, getting nothing out of it. Yeah, that was a collapse at the end. For much of the game, you know what the problem with the Eagles' defense was? The run defense. Yeah. Dijon and, and, and Algier were gashing the Eagles consistently, and that got the that, that allowed the Falcons to get downfield. So I think there's a – it's almost like a – what would you call it? Like a complementary football problem, okay? Here are the Eagles getting to the red zone and not getting touchdowns. OK, getting stopped the fourth down earlier, settling for a field goal, settling it for a field goal. I know you don't want to criticize Barkley on the drop because, uh, you know, no, he deserves a lot of criticism. You're paying a guy 13 million dollars to make a catch in the flat who's supposed to be one of the more versatile running backs in the yes. league. He deserves his criticism as much as anybody in that situation. Right. I just look at the bigger picture that you're still giving the ball back deep in yes. their own territory with the chance to close out the game on defense. And instead, it's as if they had 11 spectators on the field. And there, and, and like one tackle in bounds probably changes the dynamic, okay? Yep. One tackle. I mean, there was a broken tackle that let Mooney get a couple more yards. There's so much there. If they play, I think they outplayed the Falcons. I didn't look at like win probabilities or Aaron shots of statistics. I think they outplayed the Falcons throughout the game. It should not – they should not have been out there for that final drive. They got a stop on fourth down near midfield. The Eagles march right down the field. Barkley playing very well. He's he's grinding out yardage. I believe they should have run the ball on third and three. And if it was fourth and one, they could have attempted a tush push or kicked the field goal or seen where everybody's mindset was. But they should not have gotten the ball back. Yes, it was catastrophic at that point, but this is a team that should put their, their opponents away earlier if they play that well overall. And at home, inside of two minutes, you have the ball inside the 20-yard line. I'm with you. It's third and three. Why, the play worked. It, it's hard to criticize yeah, the play true. call from Nick Sirianni because it worked. If, if mm -hmm. Saquon catches that football, it's a first down, two kneel downs, and everybody drives home happy, and there's fireworks going off in South Philly, the whole thing. <laughs> but but I, I'm with you here. When, when you have built a foundation of an offense where inside of short yardage situations, and by that I mean inside of four yards, uh -huh. you're trying the tush push. It, yeah. It's third and three, tush push twice. <laughs> right, 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 right. Hand it to your $13 million running back and have him, you know, bulldoze up the middle. Mm -hmm. And if you get the first down and you move the chains there, great. And if you don't, try a tush push on fourth down. I think the points are less consequential there than the time on the clock. Yeah. So as a lot of people that I've seen on social media want to absolve Nick Sirianni here because of the play call, I don't know that I agree with that because philosophically it was like they got away from what they are in the game's biggest spot. And oh, by the way, that was one of the big picture reason, reasons from a culture standpoint that things went off the rails a year ago because they got away from what had worked for them the previous year when they went to the Super Bowl.
Right, and they had similar play calling earlier in the game, which is why they get a fourth down stop. They're going to Brittany, Britton Covey on a play. They do have – Devontae gets the ball knocked away from him. Okay, so that would have been a possible touchdown. Still not being sort of this power team that they have the potential to be in the red zone. Lions fans are probably saying the same thing. Like, why were we one in, one of seven in the red zone? Why weren't we just going two tight ends and slamming the ball down the throat of the Buccaneers? These are things – a lot of teams with questions. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Eagles have a lot of questions, and I think we're going to be doing a thing about some of these 2-0 and teams. They're facing the sudden emergence of the 1985 Bears meets 2007 Patriots in the frick, this freaking Saints team. And you know what the Saints team does really well? They run the football extremely yes. well. And again, and, and they're very balanced, and they can put a lot of pressure on the defense. And the Eagles have to turn around on a short week and figure out what to do about that. But what's even better about what the Saints do is they throw the ball on first down. And they decide not to throw anymore. They, they, they just run the ball with Alvin Kamara. Yeah. And, and you look at, at, at this situation, we're going to find out a lot more about just how real the Atlanta Falcons are next week when the Kansas City Chiefs come to town. We're going to yeah. find out a lot more about whether the Philadelphia Eagles are a legitimate contender or one of these middling teams like the Dallas Cowboys, whose issues can come up and bite them and cost them in situations where they don't have a lot of margin for error within the game or within the playoff race right. when they play those Saints next week. Right, and that's it. Like, and that's the thing. The Eagles can look at this and say it's a margin situation. The Lions can look at it and say it's a margin situation. 49ers get the Rams next week. I believe the Rams are all in the hospital right now. Um, and, and the Cowboys are in this different place right now because they just got steamrolled. But you mentioned the Saints, and I'm already seeing things come come across my my desk. Uh, like folks who do a lot of X and O stuff on Substack yeah. have discovered this Saints offense, and they can speak to it more eloquently than me about you know who's going where and what tight end, what package grouping, pulling, pinning, everything else like that. They don't just run with Alvin Kamara; they also run with Jamal Williams, Rashid Saheed, and Taysom Hill. You never know which two of them are going to be in the backfield at one time, going in slot, going in motion, lineup, and fullback. They have a fullback who comes in sometimes in front of one of them. So there, this is a team that can absolutely put so many different strains on you. If you try to focus on that, then you have a Lave to worry about. And Shahid is a very good wide receiver. Very suddenly, a very frightening team. You know, we would say, ah, Buccaneers 2-0, and not for real. We can we can talk. We'll talk a little bit later on about the Chargers and the, and the Steelers. But you can't you can't be uh, pessimistic. Or you can't be skeptical about the Saints right now. They're doing the thing. No, and I wrote kind of half jokingly and, and only half hyperbolically in four downs on Monday that they're the reincarnation of Kurt Warner's greatest show on turf Rams. I mean, you look through the first two <laughs> weeks, 91 points through two games, the most points the Rams ever scored in that era through two weeks. Now, obviously a little bit of a different game, different yeah. rules tilted towards the defense a little more than now, only yeah. 78 points through two weeks during that little era that they had there. But I think when you look at what New Orleans is doing, they're starting fast and then they're just continuing to put the pedal down 12 for 12 on first quarter drives, scoring touchdowns. Yes. They, they, they just can't be stopped early in these games. Now right. they had the warm up game against coastal Carolina as you have teamed <laughs> the Panthers in, in two deep zone and the walkthrough yes. each week, which I get a kick out of every time I see it in print and a Dallas Cowboy team that might've been smelling itself and reading its headlines off right. that blowout win against the Cleveland Browns. But I really think they have the weapons in place I had an executive tell me every year there's one or two teams that come out of nowhere and surprise. Right. And the Saints are this year's surprise team so far. They have the weapons. They have a quarterback who's comfortable in a scheme. And Clint Kubiak has them playing within a structure that yeah. they haven't had since Drew Brees was there. Right, right. It's a, I mean, nobody has like vaulted into the consciousness like like son of Koobs. Uh, <laughs> and and – and, and you have to. And again, it's like, I, I can be very skeptical about this. Oh, okay, X's and O's, whatever. Same guys from last year. Pretty much the same guys from last year. They draft an offensive lineman. Every name we say is familiar. You know, we've known Derek Carr for a decade. We know what he can do. I'm not naming anybody new when I talk about Alvin Kamara, Case, and Hill, those guys. Defense, same way. It's just a striking turnaround, and it's very schematic because that was a brutal team to watch with last year's offense. I believe it was Carmichael was their offensive coordinator. And it was just a slog just going through series. And now it's it, – at some point, I think teams are going to catch up. Yes. Are the Eagles coming off Monday night, giving up 80 yards in 10 seconds? Are they going to be a team that catches up quickly and figures this stuff out? I don't, I'm, I'm concerned that's not the case. Well, let me ask you this, because you and I talked about this a couple of the episodes leading into the regular season. And how many times did I say – 
oh, they better beat Green Bay because the Falcons are nothing to sleep on. And right. you can go 0-2 in a hurry here if you trip up in Brazil. The Eagles got it done. They're 1-1. One and one. But the way they lost that game to Atlanta, the way that the defense is now reeling, the way that you, you look at the inability to pressure Kirk Cousins and, and the fact that he's a, he's a rocket ship launch pad in the backfield, I, I'm not exactly, if I were an Eagles fan, I would not be very confident that they're going to all of a sudden find the magic formula for Bryce Huff to be effective, to find anybody other than Milton Williams and Jalen Carter and Brandon Graham to have momentary bursts. Right. There's so many pinball options around Derek Carr to right. get the ball out quickly and get downfield quickly and get on the board quickly. That's the problem. Now, I, I pulled this stat earlier. Derek Carr has only been in third and long third and seven plus four times through two games. Your pass rush is not going to look good if it's never third and long. Okay. If it's second right. and three, you can't pin your ears back. You can't pull out all these blitz packages, et cetera. So Eagles have to get stops early. No one's getting stops early on the saints. So Carr gets to sit back there and it's like, okay, it's third and one, my entire playbooks in front of me. Oh, it's third and 10. We're already up 21, nothing. I'll dump it off and punt. We're fine. Okay. Right. That's the, way, the game he's playing right now. Eagles got to get the Eagles got to get stops on the run. They've got to get some pass rush going. All those good feelings we had about Zach Bond two weeks ago, it seems like that was six months ago. And it's like, well, we didn't see as much of him as a pass rusher. Need to see Huff. Need to see this young man. I know there's talk about him, et cetera. This stuff has got to get worked out. 2-0 and opponent next week for the Eagles. 2-0 and opponent currently, the Buccaneers, the following week. And I think the Buccaneers have a pretty easy draw this week. So they could be facing a 3-0 and team down the road. Uh with Baker Mayfield yeah. playing the best football of his career, by the way, and, and, and a second right. new system in Tampa Bay. Another good system there. Maybe not as flashy, but like under the hood, they're not they're not running on second and 10 like they were doing a lot in years past, et cetera. More opportunities for Godwin, a little better running game. They, they haven't played a lot yet. Uh, no, they could play the Lions. I'm going to take that back. They they they, they beat the Lions. They game last week, and it lived up to the hype, and, and, yeah. and Baker Mayfield rose to the occasion with those two 11-yard scrambles. You know, right. let's switch gears and talk about some of these other 2-0 teams other than the New Orleans Saints, because I look at the Buccaneers now, you put them legitimately in the playoff conversation, in my opinion. Yeah. You saw me chewing there. I, are you I <laughs> You saw me chewing. <laughs> That's your fault for diving into the ego. <laughs> All right. But the Buccaneers, you look hey. at Baker Mayfield, right? right? You look at them getting their weapons involved. You lose Vita Vea early in that game and you still win against a team that loves to pound the rock. That's a character building team for Todd Bowles's Buccaneers going into a springboard now at two and two. Or two it and is. It's, 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 it's a resilient, it's a toughness win. It's a reminder how many of these guys have Super Bowl experience that are still running around that roster that have like that Brady uh, era experience about them. Um, I look at that game as so similar to the Eagles game last night. Because yeah. the Lions were at the 15-yard line so many times. I believe it was one of seven for touchdown conversions in that game. So you have a team that's in the Lions that are marching, marching, marching down the field and getting away from what they do right, having some execution errors also, and the Buccaneers take care of business. You talked about what the Buccaneers did. It was a couple of big scrambles. Godwin gets open on the wheel, and, and Mayfield connects with him. Mayfield's playing very, very well. Overall, I think they're playing very good complementary football where what's working works in harmony with each other. And they're facing opponents that are the expectations are high and their moments of brilliance don't turn around and turn into these big plays. I can't I can't put the Buccaneers in that conversation yet. Not with the Saints looking right. like they're gonna run away with that division. So the division title right now, I say, well, that's gonna be this the Saints, the way things are going. And then you got the Falcons who are clearly a tough out. But Buccaneers get the um get the Bo Nix experience. Lieutenant Beauregard sideways and his all sideways passing attack is coming. Um, so that that could be 3-0 and right there for the Buccaneers. Um, and then you have to take them more seriously. I don't think anybody pegged the NFC South as being the most competitive division in football. <laughs> but we're, we're staring down the barrel at potentially two 3-0 and teams, you know, going into week four. And who knows what happens in Atlanta with, with the, the Chiefs coming east. Revenge of the journeyman quarterbacks. Yes. Revenge of the Forgotten Quarter. And Andy Dalton's now in there. They're all the forgotten quarterbacks. So they, they put together a super team and they go out there and beat us with exceptional ordinariness. For sure. For sure. And you look at the two other teams, which team impresses you the most based on what we saw on Sunday? The Bills. Yeah. I guess that counts Perfect. as third. 
Thursday. Uh, and then the Saints, if we're going to do like the well, the surprising two and O teams, that's kind of be the Saints. But you know, everything was overshadowed by Tua's injury. Th- that right. game was firmly in hand when Tua got hurt. The Bills were destroying them. The Bills. I, I've talked about this on past podcasts, except for the first quarter of Week One have just been absolutely top to bottom, offense, defense, special teams, run defense, pass defense, run offense, pass offense, super balanced, super dominant. For sure. And and I still, I think that when you look at what's impressed the most outside of New Orleans, because we spent a lot of time talking about them, and and that's probably rightfully in terms of offense and complementary football, the most impressive thing, at least early on that we've seen. I I think that the Kansas City Chiefs Mm. passed a really big test as big a test as you can have in September for a team looking for a Super Bowl three peat, you know, they, they came from behind, they weathered a couple of different storms, overcame two different Patrick Mahomes interceptions in that game against Cincinnati. You talked about last week, the bills needing to show that they could come together and win using a team effort and not necessarily Josh Allen playing hero ball, which they did against Miami it became the James yes. Cook show. Yeah. I think the the Chiefs, in terms of the defense and in terms of, you know, needing to win with Mahomes not playing his best game, right. I thought that was one of those come together as a team type of moments in a game that watching it felt like it might as well have been an AFC divisional game or championship game based on how it played out and against that opponent with Joe Burrow starting to really get rolling. And they survive and they're 2-0 against two teams that at least before the season – you thought would make deep playoff runs and still might in the AFC. The, the two teams that they seem to face every year in the playoffs, often the AFC championship game, they beat them both. Uh, and, and again, they yeah, they win with defense in those games, et cetera. The Pacheco injury is Huge worth loss. monitoring. This is, this is not a team that is full of depth at running back. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, personal issues on the NFI right now. And so they have Samaje Perrine. They've got the, the kid Carson Steele. You got to have something at running back, and but what Pacheco brought broken tackles. Um, you know, he brought some receiving First. ability, and and Perrine is kind of a complementary rotation back. So they do face a tough test in the Falcons coming up, and I need to see what they're going to do over the next sixty-eight weeks because the Bills looks very good. I guess Texans look okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's another team that just feels like they, they did what they needed to do, right? I I looked at that game on, on Sunday night, and there was a feel that this was the future of the NFL taking center stage between C.J. Stroud and Caleb Williams. I, I was less blown away and impressed by the Texans' offense. I, I love the supporting cast. I thought Nico Collins took another step towards superstardom. Mm-hmm. Tank Dell showed off his speed. You saw where they went and got uh, Stephon fl- Diggs. Fl- flag on the play. Flag. Flag. Holding a, a false start, Larry Tunsil, uh, holding somebody to negate like a 30 yard CJ Stroud play. Uh, uh, first and 20. Keep going. Yes, that's how that played out for that offense. The, Danielle Hunter looks like he's going to be a player there on defense. Will, will uh, you know, Anderson looks like he's going to be a real player there. But I think the biggest takeaway was how far away the Bears and Caleb Williams are. Like, you can play hero ball at USC. Yeah. You can, you know, throw the ball, you know, 30 yards down the field when you're about to get sandwiched by two different defenders in the backfield. Mm-hmm. Tried to do that a couple of times and and Kwame Lasseter yeah. made him pay for it twice. twice. And it just looks like he's a hair off in terms of timing. And I think you'll get the timing down with DJ Moore and Keenan Allen when he gets to be fully healthy. Roma Dunze too. But it just looks like it's going to be some growing pains and some issues in terms of Caleb Williams' development. It's not a pull him out of the box, and he's a top-10 quarterback like C.J. Stroud was a year ago. Exactly. And by the way, it was three times with the interception. It's that flag holding some rando on defense that was nowhere near the play. That interception has declined, and that's why that game went until about, I think, 3.45 a.m. It in sure felt like it. Even though the Bears were nowhere in it. But in terms of the rookie quarterback, I don't want to do a huge rookie quarterback thing right now, but it boils down to Caleb Williams. He's demonstrating the the traits. It's going to take a while. Bo Nix, he's demonstrating some of the traits. If you look carefully, it's going to take a while. Jaden Daniels is demonstrating the traits and they played the Giants. Yeah. Who decided not to dress their backup kicker, even though their starting kicker was, you know, operating on one and a half legs. (laughs) Right, right, right. And And did all the other Giants things, including this very, very weak defense. That allowed Daniels, you know, to play well, distribute the ball, run the ball, kick field goal. 
repeat until you have 21 points and that's sufficient for the win. For sure. And, and we've touched on some of these 2-0 teams. Real quickly, as an aside, I just want to get it to one of the 0-2 teams that we had a lot of expectations for going into this year. The Baltimore Ravens. You, you can excuse coming from ahead and losing in Kansas City and Isaiah likely putting his toe on the line because it's Kansas City and Arrowhead in the opener. But man, to, to cough up that game against the Raiders, and now you have this brutal stretch, right? At Cowboys, yes. Bills at home, yes. At Bengals, hey, you come up for air against the Commanders. At Tampa, at Cleveland, before you catch your breath against the Broncos, November third. Right, and it's like there's a very real world. There's a world where they go one in five over yes. the next six games, and you're looking at one in seven to start the season in Baltimore. I don't know that it gets that bad. Mm-hmm. But they got to figure this thing out in a hurry because things aren't going to get any easier on the schedule. Right. And while one and five, one and seven, that seems like a worst case scenario. You start talking about, you know, your, your three and fours and things. You're, you're, you're at the bottom of the wild card pool at that point. You're at the mercy of these teams with easier schedules. Now, Eagles fans, if you're mad about the play calling and you're mad about how the situation went down, go watch a replay of the Ravens game and think about what our neighbors down I-95 are thinking. Did you get a, did you see a lot of that game? I saw the the fourth quarter of that game. Did you see the third and inches play? I don't know that I caught that one. here, Here we go. Okay. So it's third and inches. You are the Baltimore Ravens. And if you can get a first down, you might be able to salt the game away. It is third and inches. Baltimore Ravens, Baltimore Ravens roster. Matt Lombardo, what do you call? Uh, I give it to Derrick Henry and have him just, you know, ramrod it up the middle. Derrick Henry, you mean the guy who's a known short yardage back that you spent a lot of money on? Yes, that that same Derrick Henry who bulldozed from the (laughs) wildcat into the end zone in the third quarter. Yes, that Derrick Henry. Okay, well, what if, now just speculating here, what if we run a tush-push direct snap play to Isaiah Likely? Why? Okay. Why? Now hear me out. Now, since Isaiah Likely is calling for the snap, it's a totally different cadence yes. than what you're used to, which means a, a guy might jump off sides, making it third and six and turning a, an, an easy conversion to a hard conversion you miss. What do you think? What do you think of that play call? I don't love it. Even at home, I don't love it. <laughs> not with the personnel. Not with, oh, by the way, my quarterback's Lamar Jackson, yeah. who should be able to execute a quarterback sneak. Right. But if and I don't it- want to put him at peril, I can hand it off to Derrick Henry, who right. earlier in the game showed you that he can be a short yardage battering ram. Exactly. If you don't want to put Lamar in, in uh, peril, he can give the handoff and then run the bootleg on the side or do it yes. from the shotgun and then run the thing. And like two linebackers are chasing him. Yes. So it makes it easier for Henry. There's a lot of things that you can do that is not a tush push to a tight end. For sure. Right. I, I agree. And, and there's a lot of issues there in Baltimore now with, with, in terms of needing to come back from this and keep yeah. things together with a really difficult schedule. Who's the biggest surprise 2 0 team in your opinion? So, surprise 2 0 have to go with the Saints. Just about everybody else. I think we're going to talk a little bit about the Steelers with our guests later. Yes. But I'm going to say something right now about the Steelers and the Chargers. I kind of love watching them. Yeah. I kind of love watching them because it's 1974 all over again. And it is the most primitive brand of football in the world. And I kind of dig it. Yeah. You know, you watch the Steelers and it's like, okay, how many times is TJ watch is going to destroy the play today? I mean, it's, it's just like you could set your watch to it, whether it was the opener in Atlanta where he had two or three tackles for loss and a sack and, you know, yeah. forcing a fumble in the biggest moment of the game or, or on Sunday afternoon, you know, it goes on the road and does it again in, in Denver. It, it, it just looks like TJ Watt is on that ascent Yes. to making a real run at yet another Defensive Player of the Year award. And in in Los Angeles, that's probably my biggest surprise, too, and oh, just because okay. of how quickly the, the culture has taken root and the game plan has taken root with Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers. It helps that Justin Herbert is healthy. But by the way, before we go any further on the Chargers, mm-hmm. what in God's name was Justin Herbert doing in the game in the fourth quarter <laughs> against the Chanticleers of Coastal Carolina <laughs> with a three-touchdown lead. He, he ended up in the medical tent, and then yeah. they put him back out there. Right? 
this is how you get people injured. We saw it in Los Angeles a couple years ago with Justin Herbert and with Mike Williams. We saw this happen. If you're Jim Harbaugh, I don't care what you're trying to build. I don't care what message you're trying to send. When you have a 10 plus point lead, if you've already cashed out your bet yeah. on bets 365 when you're up by 17, get your quarterback on the bench. Put him in bubble wrap. You're in no danger. You know, I saw you saying that on threads during the games, and I wasn't focused on that one. I'm like, okay, Matt. I mean, it's 23 to 6 or whatever it is. I I know it's the Shannon Clears, but you, you got to keep your quarterback out there. Then I was doing the rewatch. Like, oh, wait, he went to the tent? Herbert yes. went to a tent? He's got a, he's got an ankle? But yeah, then absolutely. It's like, we don't need you. All we're doing is handing it off to, to J.K. Uh, Dobbins and to um, – Gus Edwards over and over again. It's fine. But, you know, Harbaugh probably wanted to grab a helmet and go out there himself and, right. and, and run things a little bit. And they probably told him, no, that's even more dangerous. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, the culture and all that thing, it's Cro Magnon football. They're facing some easy opponents. Their defense looks very good because it's just they're, they're, they're teeing off right now. And Bosa and Mack are both healthy and they still have some left in the tank. That's great. I, I just enjoy it. Because it's not this thing where it's like, even though we don't have good wide receivers, we got to put our backup wide receivers out there and spread them out all over the field. And then, you know, Herbert's going to play hero ball or Justin Fields is going to play hero ball or Derek Carr is going to play hero ball. Like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to get first and 10, then we're going to get second and four, and then maybe we get third and inches. And that's how we're going to play. And it's refreshing right now. It is. And I think that one team where they're just looking up at the sky and trying to figure out how the heck are we 2-0 oh at this point, it's the Minnesota Vikings. Yes. You, know, you, you lose J.J. McCarthy going into the year, and who knows if he would have wound up being the starting quarterback. He probably would have at some point. Sam Darnold wakes up in, in Kevin O'Connell's system, and all of a sudden, all past sins are forgiven from his <laughs> disastrous tenure and seeing ghosts against pass yeah. rushers that the, – of, of of NFL seasons past at MetLife Stadium from his disaster in Carolina. All of a sudden, they're 2 Now, they lose Justin Jefferson, which could be cataclysmic for them. It sounds like a, no, a nothing burger. This it, Everything's very encouraging right now. So well, that would be good. And, and yeah. maybe make a run at 3-0. and But nevertheless, most importantly, Justin Jefferson might have avoided season yeah. injury. We'll see. Yeah, we'll go. But I'm, I'm blown away that they were able to not only pull this off, but do what they did by punching the San Francisco 49ers in the mouth mm -hmm. and walking away and holding on, even though the Niners nearly came back and won that game. Character-building win for the Vikings in Week 2. Brian Flores' defense is very confusing. It's doing a – it's it's really – it confused Purdy. Yeah. Okay. And he has more to work with on his side of the ball this year. He's got some guys who are scheme guys that he likes and some younger players. Um I've had the Darnold in September. I, I posted stats last week about Darnold in September. Don't be fooled by September Don, Darnold. Uh, when, when, when the leaves turn, Darnold turns. That's going to happen. But by then, they get Addison back. They might get Hawkinson back. That they're, they're, you know, they're going to be a tough out at the very least. I think they're the team people thought the Bears were going to be. Yeah. I think you're right. like, oh, we can go out there with sort of a journeyman quarterback or a rookie quarterback in this case. And with these weapons and with this system, we can do, do a lot. The team I'm like, how is this team two and oh? Is the Seattle Seahawks? Right, right. They, I mean, it, okay. So you face just Geno Smith continuing the 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 stock market trend, and <laughs> up 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 into the right he goes. It's Kevin another Walker one of his thing. It's another one of the extraordinary quarterbacks. This is going to be my late week column, by the way. He's extraordinary, and and of course, okay. So they faced Lieutenant Beauregard sideways, and and the and the Broncos. Uh, they faced. Crash test dummy Brissett yeah. <laughs> and, and the, and the, and another team with nothing but a running game. Like, Oh, we got a running game. You got, you do have a running game. You need everything else in new England. So they get these wins, but they won these games ugly. It's not like, oh, okay, we're the saints and we're steamrolling them along the way. They're playing down to their level. They're committing safeties. They're having a hard time executing on third down. They're muffing punts. And yet, you know, that the Gino makes a couple of plays. Metcalf makes a couple of plays. Smith and Jigba is playing. I can't pronounce his name. He's you hit, you hit it. And Smith and Jigba? Yes, you hit it right, right. there. You yep. watch enough Ohio State playing Penn State, so you got that name down. Um, I, I, I've seen that that nightmare a few times, yes. Yes, for him just picking you apart with like 10 catches. Him and Marvin Harrison Jr., yes. Yeah, so yeah, I, yes. I see them in yeah, my nightmares. You, you've lived that nightmare a few times, and they're finding a way. And I believe they've got 
Skylar Thompson and the Dolphins. So you're looking at a potential three and O team here that I don't think is very good. No, I, I agree with you. And in the backdrop of there are suddenly some questions about the 49ers and some concerns about the 49ers with Christian McCaffrey yeah. going on IR. And, and, and again, Jordan Mason, another solid performance, but you can't win with Jordan Mason alone. I don't, I, I don't think. But Jordan Mason only a Brandon Ayuk and, and George Kittle and uh, Debo. Well, not, not Debo. Debo Samuel looks like he's hurt, could miss at least this yeah. week. Okay. Uh, Trent Williams is starting to leak a little bit of oil. It looked yeah. like in that game against the, the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. We all talked about this going in. I think, you know, your, your biggest concern a couple weeks ago was who can stop the 49ers or well, 49ers can stop themselves. Mm-hmm. Mine was father time and injuries. Right. It, it seems like the injury bug is starting to take some more nibbles than it has in years past. Yeah. And we're going to find out pretty quickly here, yes. whether or not th- this is going to become a thing. With right. the Super Bowl hangover and the injuries, if that continues to chip away enough, that maybe it opens the door for a Seattle Seahawks or an Arizona Cardinals or a Los Angeles Rams to right the ship and make this a competitive division at the very least. Right now, for now, I, I'm listening. I'm, I'm monitoring the situation. I kind of wrote that off as Monday night going on the road on Sunday, 98 yard touchdown goes against you and you're kind of a little caught off guard. And it's like, Teams get upset like that from time to time. 49ers get the Rams this week, and we already mentioned them. I have no idea who's left. It's Matthew Stafford is Omega Man at this point. He's yeah. Charlton Heston driving around, just smashing into things. I think the 49ers get a rebound win here. It's more like longitudinally what they do moving forward and whether they have all the answers and whether they can handle adversity. I love trolling 49ers fans like, oh, did one of your 37 stars get hurt and now you have to have a three-game losing streak? Oh, but – Let's see them overcome that. Let's show show us that when you have the normal injuries other teams have, you've got answers for it. And that was a that was the temperament of that team a year ago when you yeah. looked at McCaffrey getting hurt, when you looked at Ayuk missing some time, when right. you looked at Trent Williams going down. Right. You take one cog out of the machine, right, and it sputters. That, that's just what they are. Right. That 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 is kind of that's the reputation that they're trying to overcome, and I and I love needling on it. Okay. <laughs> for sure and if you look to the west uh, in, in western pennsylvania in the great commonwealth of the pittsburgh steelers who are playing mike tomlin pittsburgh steeler football absolutely it's it's very old school i don't know how sustainable it is it is fun to watch defense looks good got a little bit of a quarterback controversy there though let's find out about that controversy yeah. Mike, I'm really excited about this because as we touched on a little bit earlier, one of those 2-0 teams is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And our next guest knows a thing or two about not only playing in Pittsburgh, but playing at a high level and being successful with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's former Steelers quarterback Charlie Batch and also the CEO of the Batch Foundation. You can follow him on X at CharlieBatch16. Charlie, how's it going, my friend? Everything is well. How you doing, sir? We're doing great over here, and obviously it's a very unique situation and kind of unstealer like in Pittsburgh when you have a little bit of a quarterback controversy that's been budding over the last few weeks. What's your read on the situation over there? Because you look at Justin Fields, they've now gone two games without turning the ball over, and with that defense, with that much talent, is that enough to separate him from Russell Wilson going forward? Well, it, it, it's, we're all learning this as it moves forward. And I say that only because Russell Wilson was the starter heading into training camp. And on the first day, he was injured and he missed the first 10 days, just kind of worked himself back into it. But Justin was running with the ones. And it wasn't until the week of the final preseason game where Russell was coming back. He played a series, got him, led him into the end zone. And then he was getting ready for week one. And then all of a sudden, the injury happens during the course of week one. And I tell you, the thing that's kind of interesting is the fact that as he was preparing, To be the starter just a couple days prior to, he was voted a captain by his teammates. So now here he is, is injured, and then all of a sudden Justin Fields goes out there and not just win one, but he wins two games and is really creating a lot of buzz, not just in Pittsburgh, but throughout the country as it relates to what happens. But if you look at everything that Tomlin has done prior to, Russell Wilson is his guy. But then if you look back at things that he's done in the past, mainly last year, Kenny Pickett was his starter, but he rode the hot hand with Mason Rudolph as they entered into the playoffs. So this is a very similar situation moving forward. And I think this question ultimately will reveal itself the moment that Russell Wilson is 100% healthy. And what is the Steelers record up until that point? So there's a lot of moving pieces in this particular equation. 
you've been in the building with Mike Tomlin. How does he handle, say, the quarterback personalities and, and expectations and egos in a situation like this? Yeah, well, a lot of it's different, right? Because when Tom, Mike Tomlin inherited this team, Ben Roethlisberger was his quarterback. So you truly never really had to make that decision unless there was an injury that occurred. And then you're only riding maybe one or two games that the backup has to fill in and then Ben comes back. It wasn't until, what, 2020, I think it was, or 2019, whenever Ben got hurt, and then uh, Mason Rudolph had to start, and I think that was the second week of the season whenever Ben got hurt at home. So it's just one of those things to where it's a new scenario as we're moving forward. And I think it just is really is hard. As long as I've been around the Steelers team, it's hard to answer that question because this is truly the first time that Mike Tomlin really had to deal with this. Hmm. Now, Trevor, you're still involved, obviously, with the organization as part of the, the radio broadcast team and, you know, post game shows. So you're around the building. You've seen a lot of practices in training camp. Is there something about Justin Fields skill set, temperament, whatever you might want to call it, that might separate him from Russell Wilson? Because let's be honest here, if you're thinking ahead to the future, you have a 26 year old quarterback who might have upside against a Russell Wilson who has the track record and obviously some veteran stability that Mike Tomlin might like. But is there something about Fields' game that might ultimately win him this starting job if this conversation comes to pass that we're talking about here? Yeah, the difference is Justin Fields has experience, and typically you don't have a quarterback this young that has been a starter in the league. Generally, it's a backup. Do you kind of work him into the equation? Do you not? But the way that this scenario happened this offseason where you were able to now really change the whole quarterback room for what it was in 2023 to now 2024 with Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. So with that being said, that's the difference right now, experience and him coming in here, being able to lean on that experience, even though it didn't happen in Pittsburgh, but he still had it in Chicago and then ultimately here. That is the part that now is a little bit different because he's, you know, his win and boss record is not there but he still has shown the ability to do so right when you talk about over 2200 yards rushing being able to add that element to this offense that wasn't necessarily here in years past somebody like Russell Wilson who has the ability who in his in the course of his career used the mobility as a strength so it's just something that really when you have a lot of that I think Mike Tomlin was really looking for Russell to add and help that leadership role to help fill that void for Justin Fields for whatever and whenever he was going to be called upon. We just didn't know it was going to happen this soon. What do you make of Arthur Smith's offense, your first impressions over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it really is it's surprising. And I say it's surprising only because they haven't been able to score touchdowns. When I watched them all through training camp, they're moving the ball up and down, using middle of the field. And then you get the week one and they don't use the middle of the field. And that reason would being was because Jesse Bates in Atlanta, his experience with him. And he's saying, listen, I am not letting him disrupt the game because of Jesse's uh, resume. When you talk about resume, over 100 tackles, or and then you're talking about, I think it was over 200 tackles that he had over the last two years, 10, 10 interceptions. So that element you're looking at is say, this guy is not going to disrupt the game. So you don't use the middle of the field there, and then you get to Denver, they're pushing the ball down the field using play action, but yet penalties negated a lot of those things there. So I think right now we're still scratching the surface as it relates to what Arthur Smith's offense truly looks like I just want to see him get better in the red zone because up until this point he's only one for four in the red zone so they need more opportunities there I think Eagles fans discovered Jesse Bates disrupting the game at the end of the fourth quarter uh mm -hmm. yesterday but yeah what I've seen out of Arthur Smith's offense so far a lot of three tight end attacks a lot of like two tight end two back smash mouth football do you think that's sustainable or do you think that uh, that they plan to open things up as the season goes on well, I think a lot of that's going to be week to week, right? And, and it, especially when you get into the division, the weather starts to change. You want to see that kind of second half of the year, not necessarily now. But when you look at just the manner of the of the roster, you know, you have uh, Pat Fryermuth is here. Then you have a big body in Darnell Washington that can move people around six, seven, close to 300 pounds and then shows his pass catching ability with the first touchdown catch of the year last uh, last week. This is something that he gets excited about. And they have a, a young guy, uh, uh, Pruitt, who was the third tight end here along with Connor Hayward. So there are a lot of options that he has. So you know he's going to utilize those three uh, three tight end sets. And it's just a matter of really just you know being able to pick those third downs up, giving yourself a new set of downs to seeing this offense flourish. So to, the, to your point of using those big bodies, I expect him to use a lot of that 
uh, play action game and getting Fryer moved a lot more involved the more we get into the season. Yeah, and, and Charlie, we talked a lot about whether it's Justin Fields or Russell Wilson. One of the best friends for a quarterback, whoever it is, is a strong running game, right? I mean, you know that better than anybody based on some of the backs that you had the opportunity to play with in Pittsburgh. But there was a lot of talk going into this year that Najee Harris was in line for a diminished role, that Jalen Warren was going to become the guy, that perhaps since they didn't pick up the fifth-year option, this might be the Najee Harris swan song. Well, two weeks in and small sample size and all that, Najee Harris is the Steelers' leading rusher through the first two games of the year. Seems to be as big a part of the offense as ever. What have been your impressions of Najee Harris in this scheme, and what's been his biggest key to success so far this year? But for him, it's el- eliminating the distractions, right? And we hear it a lot, you know, block out the noise and those type of things. But for him, you know, he wanted a contract extension. You have three straight years of a thousand yard seasons, and then all of a sudden, you get to the point where the the um, the business now has to happen, right? The Steelers have to make a decision, and from an organizational standpoint, they de- they did de- turn uh, decline it, and then it allows speculation is to say what happens after this year, right? So I think when you do that. Those are things to where you had a report where Jalen Warren, it was like, hey, they want to see him more involved in Arthur Smith's offense, but yet he was injured as they had approached the regular season. So that really never materialized, even though Jalen is starting to get back into the groove of things, and he's going to now play a little bit more of a role as that second back uh, to Najee Smith, I mean, Najee Harris. I think when you get to this particular point, Najee just putting his head down. He understands the economics as it relates to just the evolution of the running back in this in this league. And he's just trying to do his part and that's help this team win. And he has done nothing but be singularly focused on helping his team and hopefully bring another Lombardi trophy back to Pittsburgh because it's been a very long time. Even though we talk about it, we want these players to experience that because this, quite frankly, that's how Steelers Nation was created with the arrogance of winning the division and bringing home those Lombardi trophies. And when that hasn't happened, these guys now are starting to be chomping at the bit a little bit to say, hey, we don't have many, much time, especially when you ha- uh, have the strength of the team that they have now and ultimately want to bring that vision home. And I'm hoping that they do it. And, and obviously the Steelers, the foundation of the franchise, right, is, is pounding the rock with the running game. You look at the defense, you have T.J. Watt as dominant as ever, Minka Fitzpatrick on the back end, Joey Porter Jr., playmakers at all three levels, Cam Hayward having a great year. You look at the, what they're doing right now. Is it just going to be about eliminating turnovers, running the ball, and playing stifling defense? Can that formula succeed in 2024? Uh, it can. I just don't think the fans have enough patience to have to go every 60 minutes to watch a football game to decide whether you win or not. Right. And that's just something that, you know, you kind of go through it. it. But right now, this is how this team is is formulating. And I think these these are things that when you're watching other other teams and they're throwing the ball around and putting up all of this yardage, but yet you have the Steelers that are controlling the time of possession. You're creating the turnovers or plus five right now in the turnover ratio. You, now you just have to create the, and score touchdowns. If you're able to do that, then that allows that separation to happen. But until then, you know, right now you still got to make sure because Justin, quite frankly, didn't know that he was starting until we're about, you know, seven to 10 days of the season. As he gets more comfortable, the offense is going to open up. I don't have any problems as issues as it relates to where I think this offense is going to go. It's just a matter. I hope it soon, happens sooner rather than later, because even though they have the Chargers this week, when you look at that whole month of October, the people around the league they wanted to see this team get on a high horse right and you do that because they have three night games in the month of october so when you get to that particular point you'll have dallas in october then you'll turn around and have the jets on a sunday night you have the giants on a monday night so now the whole country is going to watch this offense unfold now it's that time to see if they can get better week to week and it's not going to be an easy test as they have the Chargers here this week that's right. You can't look past this Chargers team that is 2-0. And look what they're doing right now. They're pounding the ball between the tackles. They're playing physical football and they're playing defense. This is going to be kind of a, a test matchup here for whether the Steelers can win that type of game. Absolutely. And nobody really expected either team to probably be 2-0 and entering into this game. But when you look at just the manner of the Chargers and how Jim Harbaugh has that team made up, this probably might be the fastest game in the history of the National yes. Football League <laughs> the next week. They ran, you know, Car- uh, Chargers ran it 44 times against the Panthers. The Steelers ran it 36 times against the Broncos. So this may be one of those ones that ends well before four o'clock. So, but either way, it's going to be testing the, you know, physical ability of that offensive line who can move each other 
Uh, now that the Steelers have the opportunity to come back home, crowd noise should not be a factor. Hopefully those guys can get off a split second faster than what they've been doing over the past two weeks. But when you're able to now grind and claw and pull those victories together, now it makes it a little bit easier to come home. But now you have a tough AFC foe coming into here. And obviously, you know, just the only time that they're going to play each other, but it ultimately can implement implement what the playoff implications look like in December January because this is an AFC game that you have to have Charlie not to make a complete you know right turn here but I'm going to do it anyway Uh, you know you look at what's happening in Carolina right now and you take Bryce Young number one overall just last year and obviously he's had a lot of struggles there are a lot of question marks about his size whether or not he was a complete whiff but you're you're you've been a veteran quarterback in a lot of quarterback rooms and being the first guy to, to have the rug pulled out from underneath you being, you know, it's put yourself in Bryce Young's shoes and in that quarterback room. What is Andy Dalton? What is head coach Dave Canales? What do they need to do to kind of stabilize things, not only in a bad situation where you're 0 2, but, you know, you're, you're making a quarterback change two weeks into the season and going away from the highly touted rookie that maybe a lot of guys on that team had bought into thinking that he would be something that they would build around. Yeah, this is probably the first time in his career that he really truly had to battle these particular things, right? Alabama, everything kind of went his way. You win the Heisman, then you come into Carolina. Of course, yeah, you're going to be on the on, a, on a, a, probably a bad team. We know that as your number one pick. But when you go through it, you're just like, wow, this is tough. And you just hopefully things continue to uh, progress. But when you make a change like this, everybody's saying you're the reason why we're losing. So if Andy comes in and wins, then maybe that validates the decision. But if he doesn't, then you have to go back to Bryce and say, oh, we made a mistake. Now it's your time to come in here and help us. That is a very tough task. And that's why when you look at quarterback rooms, that's a delicate task because you want everybody to one, you know, come together. And ultimately, when you're the backup to a young player, you want to make sure that you're you know, delivering information that's going to help him uh, succeed. But then when that doesn't happen and now the backup coming in is it, it, a lot of things. You're you're turning over a lot of rocks right now right. Um, trying to keep that team together. And it's going to be up to the coaching staff to see if they can do that, because ultimately right now you made a decision and you hope that everything uh, pans out in the manner of making that decision that they made going to Andy Dalton. Charlie, you're also very involved, uh, obviously, as the CEO of the Batch Foundation. Tell us what you have going on there. I know the foundation is built on the structure of providing year-round education for hundreds of thousands of people across Western Pennsylvania and, and, and kids. What do you have going on over there? And, and tell us how people can find out more. Oh, I appreciate it. We have, we're super excited about what we have going on at the Best of the Batch Foundation. We just celebrated 25 years of being around in, in April. So this is a centennial year for us as we nice. are excited about it. So we currently serve 3,800 kids annually throughout nine counties uh, throughout Southwestern PA. And we're an educational foundation and we focus on our STEAM programs and we focus on after school time. So we're super excited about that. We have a phenomenal team. And as we just kind of get back, we just celebrated um, our annual backpack giveaway. We call it Batch Packs. Uh, we give out close to the, uh, close to 3,000 book bags filled with school supplies, in addition to teacher supplies, because with the teachers need help, because a lot of them are digging in their own pockets to try to make sure that they're able to have all the supplies that they knew, need throughout a school year. So we're just trying to show our token of appreciation that way um, as we move forward, you know, as we, uh, we just expanded, we went from 5,300 square feet to 33,000 square feet that we just uh, had a big celebration in April of this year. So, uh, you know, the reason why we built the building and, and, and the kids don't want to leave, which is why we built the building. So we're super excited about that. And it definitely um, takes a lot of our time as we run uh, 11 to 13 different programs throughout the course of the year. So if anybody wants to learn more about what we're doing, they can go to batchfoundation.org and we would love the opportunity to work with you. I saw pictures of the new facility online. It looks amazing. And I love as a former teacher. I love the fact that so much of the focus is on the after school time, like the three to six time, because uh, you know it, I know it. a lot of parents don't know it, a lot of community members don't know it. You think about kids getting in trouble or, or being at risk on like Saturday night at midnight. Those problems usually start at about four o'clock in the afternoon, right? When these kids are coming home, possibly to an empty house or just going out doing whatever in a community where the adults aren't around. 
Right. And a lot of kids, no, a lot, there's a lot of kids that don't play sports, right? So you do have some that go to sports, but you do have a lot of them who are, who have that downtime. So one thing that we always do when they come in is to make sure, you know, the first 45 minutes is homework time. So when you come in, that's it. And then ultimately they get an opportunity to, you know, what, if there's not a particular program going on, they can roam the building, there's free time, they could do whatever they choose to do. But also people forget about the fact that a lot of these kids don't have anything to eat. So when they come to our building, they actually are able to eat and we feed every kid that comes in here at four o'clock. And the reason being uh, in school right now, they are being served lunch at 10 or 1030 in yes. the morning. Yes. By 230, when they get out of school, these kids are starving. So we want to make sure we're trying to close that gap. And the pandemic helped, uh, you know, bring a lot of these things to light, because even when school's out, people forget about the fact that these kids they depend on breakfast and lunch in school to eat so these are things that we always try to fill the gap we help bridge it that's why we work with over 22 different school districts so we work directly with the guidance counselors the administration uh, administrators to make sure that we're doing what our we're trying to do our small part to help them succeed and in addition to making sure that these kids have every opportunity to succeed at this thing called life and we're just trying to do our small part phenomenal Charlie, this has been tremendous, very insightful on the Steelers, but really appreciated of even more of the work you're doing with the Best of the Bats Foundation. Once again, how can people find out more? How can they donate? How can they get involved? Yes, you can go, you go to batchfoundation.org. You can see all of the programs that we run throughout a calendar year. And as we kind of move forward to the holiday times, you know, we do have a Thanksgiving drive where we have we adopt over 200 families. During the holidays, we call it Batch of Toys, where we collect unwrapped toys, we wrap them, and then we actually deliver them to families. So last year, we adopted over 400 families, which was close to 1,800 kids, that we were able to make sure that they had a holiday and a memorable experience during that holiday time. So we're ramping up as the year goes on. So we're excited about it. But if, like I said, if anybody, um, if they want to see what we're doing, want to be a part of what we're doing, they can go to batchfoundation.org. And we're just trying to make sure that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to make the wheel stronger. He's Charlie Batch. Follow him on X at Charlie Batch 16 and check out batchfoundation.org. Charlie, been tremendously insightful. Really appreciate you taking the time and we'll talk to you further up the road. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, fellas. Great stuff from Charlie Batch there, Mike. Absolutely. I wore black in his honor today. I like that. And you found the podcast out. I know that it was, uh, <laughs> it was in, getting lost a few weeks ago. It was buried under like some paperwork and waffles over here in the corner. <laughs> It's a great place for it to be. And of course, if we arrived at this portion of the podcast, it's time to turn the page and look ahead a little bit to week three. Mike, what is your circle of game for this coming weekend? Well, it can be nothing else but the Malik Willis revenge game of the Packers against the Titans. I'm kidding. Oh. I'm kidding. Although I guess I'm mildly interested in that. I'm going <laughs> to, I kind of want to watch that game to see if uh, Brian Callahan actually like grabs Will Levis by the horse collar and drags him into the locker room because he certainly threw him under the bus during his Monday press conference after that Carson Wentzian turnover. I don't know that I've ever heard a head coach call his starting quarterback dumb, but here we are. Son, what is your major malfunction? That's kind of like the attitude he was coming at with that. Oh, my God. Yeah, and, and I want to see if uh, if LaFleur calls any pass plays. Any pass plays. I, I got a big under. I got 135 under passing yards for Malik Willis last week. And I nailed that sucker. Nice. Great plus, call. Love plus it. 200 or something like that. Every time there was a screen pass, I was having a panic attack. Oh no, he made a man miss, you know, like eight yard screen pass could have like destroyed me. Um, but I'm going to go with one. We talked about a little bit. We got the Vikings against the Texans. We've talked about both teams earlier. I need a more consistent, less penalty prone game from the Texans to feel comfortable putting them up in that bills category. And I can't, and no team should be able to overlook the Minnesota Vikings at this point. Again, they have the scheme. Donald's playing well right now. It, it's different if Jefferson's out, but I think Jefferson's back, and that's going to make this a tough out for the Houston Texans. What about you? That's a great game, but the one that I have circled on my calendar is Ravens at Cowboys down in Arlington, the scene yeah. of the crime from the first degree murder committed by the New Orleans Saints <laughs> at Jerry World last week. This is fascinating for me. It's now or never. For the Baltimore Ravens, yeah. and as much of a fan of chaos theory as I am, I kind of want to see what happens if they open up 0-3, because it, it is just not gone the way that John Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson expected. And on the flip side of that coin, this is a lame duck year in, in Dallas for Mike McCarthy. They're 1-1. One one. They took care of business on the road against Deshaun Watson and the Browns. 
What do they do here? How did they respond after being systematically dismantled by the Saints in their own building? What's the response? How do you climb back? How do you bounce back from that? What does Dak Prescott do? Does that defense, does Michael Parsons or Demarcus Lawrence decide to put on a uniform on Sunday? <laughs> That's the game that I can't wait to see. Yeah, yeah you, you, you referenced greater chaos theory. You know, you want to see the, the Ravens go on three just to see what happens. I think they pull together with 25 years of institutional experience and pull themselves together. If the Cowboys go one or two, that's going to be Troy coming in with the pizza and the entire room is on fire. That's what that's going to be. So I I, I will be, I, that's a great circle of game, but I'll be looking for the Ravens to bounce back a little bit just to see how the Cowboys respond. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Mike, this podcast was a lot of fun. Thanks to Charlie Batch for joining us of the Batch Foundation and talking Steelers with us and being insightful. Thanks to all of our friends in Belgium for pushing us up to number two in the podcast rankings. A little bit of housekeeping for you. If you enjoy the podcast, Please subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store. Leave us a five-star review. Rate, rate us five stars. It's a huge help. It helps boost the show in the algorithm, helps people find us. And even if you want to blast us in the review, make fun of us, rip us, Please. we'll read it on the show. C complain about us eating on air, which I think is kind of like not very podcast form. I, I tried to go like this at one point. Um, but if, if you hate it, if you love it, leave a five-star review. Tell us about it. And we promise to stop no matter what, because I don't think we're doing this again. And, and of course, be sure to subscribe to Mike Tanier's Two Deep Zone on Substack. Subscribe to Between the Hashmarks Substack to get my Monday morning column, Four Downs. You subscribe to the Two Deep Zone, you'll get Walkthrough, you'll get Stat Watch, you'll get Tank Watch, you get all of the insight, jokes, and comedy from Mike that you expect on this podcast in written form. Mike, this was a lot, was a lot of fun. I can't wait for week three and can't wait for next week. Can't wait for next week, next week either, or Sunday, I should say. I'm skipping Thursday because I don't need to watch the Jets Patriots game, but I can't wait for next week. Have a great one, everybody.